Hi, it's Mike again from Scratch, and welcome back. Today we are going to spend one more hour with Blender. Uh, I've done two parts of the series already, more or less. The idea is we spend one hour covering a very specific topic, as much detail as we possibly can cram in in that single hour on a topic in Blender. The very first hour we spent was on dealing with Blender itself, navigating around the UI, what everything does, the different modes, the, you know, basically kind of an hour-long guided tour of here's Blender, here's how to use it. I taught you basic things like navigating the camera, resizing windows, um, switching between windows, different modes, different such, and I assume you've watched that or you already know how to move your way around Blender at this point. So that's the first hour we dealt with. The second hour was specifically about modeling. Uh, that is essentially taking things like this cube right here and making something out of it. Uh, we, we learned about things like uh, vertices, edges, edge loops, polygons, um, extrusions, beveling, etc. Basically all the little building blocks you'd use to make up a 3D object in 3D space. Today we are going to look at coloring that object specifically. Uh, how you add something to the surface of it. Um, and more or less that breaks down to a couple of specific topics. They all are interlingled, intermingled. Um, first off you've got something called a material. A material is uh, you can think of it as the container or the description of a surface. It's got really important information in it. Stuff like, what color is this thing? That's kind of important, right? Um, a material is sort of the top level description of how this surface works. Now, I have a very game-centric approach. I run a site called Game From Scratch. I assume the majority of my audience are interested in game-specific development, not necessarily Blender development. So Blender using Blender for games. Um, and in that case, you kind of have to use a subset of what's available in Blender because it's ultimately coming down to your game engine, what's supported. And what that generally means is texture maps, UV maps, and a few other things like normal maps, etc. There's all kinds of stuff built into Blender that simply will not be exported outside. Things like procedural maps, things like um, programmatic generation of sky maps or uh, marble or these things that are kind of like if you're only ever working in Blender, building it in Blender, for Blender, they work fine. But we want to deal specifically with stuff that can be exported to a game engine. Uh, so that means texture maps, surface maps. Maps are basically just um, 2D graphics of some kind, generally images or pictures or textures, uh, that we then want to wrap onto a surface. Uh, now, wrapping something onto a surface is just really... Well, it's called a UV map, and quite literally, map is what they mean. It's taking something that's 2D and mapping it to 3D space. Now, the question is, how is this done? And that is, again, called UV mapping. UV stands for, actually, UV means absolutely squat. Uh, the thing is, X, Y, and Z are already taken. X, Y, and Z describe, um, you know, this vertex right here, this vertex right here. I'll bring up the tool and show you what I mean. Ah, now, uh, properties, let me switch over. So if I grab this vertex right here, go up here and we can see that it's located at 1 minus 1, 1. So this X, this Y, and this Z location. So a coordinate in 3D space, X, Y, and Z, just define a location. Well, U and V are the exact same thing, but they're just a 2D coordinate in a picture. So what you're saying is this pixel at this location on this map goes here. So now the challenge is, how do you take something that's 3D and map it into 2D? And the simple answer is, you make it 2D. And that's the very first thing we have to cover in UV mapping. Now, in order to get there, though, we have to kind of talk about something else very quickly first. And let's go on back. Get rid of all this stuff. So here's our basic scene. We're not going to need animation at all, so let me just get rid of the timeline today. All right. So here's our uh, basic cube as it stands. Right now, there is... A material applied to it automatically when you work in something in blender it's automatically got a material applied and we come on over here to our uh, properties window here and the material is this guy the editor is this um, this checkered sphere here icon and as you can see we've got our cube and this is the material that's attached to it you can create new ones um, you can get rid of them etc just pluses and minus to add or subtract them but here is a preview of what your uh, material looks like. It's just a gray surface right now, and you can see right here the end result. And every surface has a material in Blender. And a lot of these properties can actually make it out. And this is your simple stuff, your 
uh, fundamentals like your color, the way you react to light, uh, your transparency, etc. like that. And let's play with a couple of those things right now. Um, as you can see here, you're starting with a sphere. You can have your preview be a box, a monkey, etc. So let me just, we're dealing with a box. I'll let the preview be a box. And let's play with it. We come down here, there's a couple of different settings, and they're all broken down into panels like so. This first one is diffuse. Uh, diffuse is, um, well, the mathematical term is it's more or less how uh, the surface reacts to light. In the real world terms, if you want to think about it and never think about math again, diffuse is color. The color of your surface is determined by um, diffuse. So I come in here, and you see this got this nice little um, uh, did a color box right here. We can come in and click it and then pick a color for our surface. So if we want this cube here to be blue, we'll just come in here and set its diffuse value to blue. Uh, you can change the intensity. Uh, this is basically the, uh, I think it's kind of about the light level of the material itself. Um, not as opposed to scene lights, just in general, like the, the brightness of the material. Sorry, that's a better way of saying it. Uh, next up is you have your specular. Um, specular is sort of how light is gonna respond to it. Um, for the most part, if you're running with a game engine, you probably aren't going to export a specular material. It's not something to know about, to need to know about anyways, but it's like, um, you know when you say you've got a chrome ball and you've got a light next to it, and it creates those rings or circles on it? That is the specularity in effect. Um, not really something we need to touch on too much here, just be aware of it. Um, over here you can actually change the, um, the shader vibes, types. Um, again, this is not really going to be... Um, exported well to a game engine, so that's only really kind of useful if you're working directly in Blender itself. Uh, but you can change the way that the diffuse color is calculated. So I can switch this over to um, a tune shader, and then you got sort of different values, different ways it goes. But we'll stick with the uh, the default Lambert shading. Uh, so that's the programmatic shading model. Um, again, if you have no reason to change it, stick with Lambert. Um, Next up, we go down here. So that's uh, the, the biggest one you're going to want to deal with, again, is diffuse. And diffuse you can literally think of as color. Let's close that one down. Um, shading, you can have it so that it emits light. See? So it's kind of glowing. And this would be handy because if you had another surface right here, um, this surface now with this emit value set would actually color the other surface as well. So it basically turns your surface into uh, a light source as well. Um, and get translucency then is how see-through your object is. Uh, so now it is 85% trans or 87% translucent. I think I need to switch to a higher fidelity viewport mode for you to even see. Okay, so nope, translucency needs another value uh, set. Okay, I'm not really sure what we're gonna use that one for. We'll just turn that off for now. Uh, get out of here. Oh, by the way, you could switch over to a rendered mode, which renders your changes on the fly. I'll actually leave it in there for now. Uh, so this is like a mini renderer that's rendering the surface um, using the lights, etc., in your scene uh, to show you the effects of what you're changing. Uh, next up, you got transparency. Transparency and translucency are sort of overlapping. We can come here and go transparency, and your alpha level, like so, we now have a 30% opaque model. So you can only see 30% of what you've got, or you can go back to 100 now the reality is again, these values, it's questionable if your game engine is gonna support them or not. Um, so it's kind of up to you. If you want a real high fidelity, like if you're ray tracing, you're creating a scene, rendering it for creating a, say a cutscene or a movie or a single still frame, you can switch to ray trace and cause your transparency effects to be calculated uh, very precisely, very mathematically, uh, with a lot more details. You can set the glossiness up of your transparency. You can make neat, uh, glass-like effects, etc., but we're not. Again, we're, we're going to ultimately be exporting in real time. A lot of the rest of this really is kind of meaningless to you uh, from a game perspective. Now, what you do occasionally have is this guy. Um, this sometimes needs to be checked uh, for certain game engines, but it's way beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Just be aware of if your um, if your game engine has limitations on how uh, how textures can be exported, you may have to set face texture on in your material. Uh, but for the most part, that's all you're really gonna come in here for. You can change the way that, um, you know, you can have it so it doesn't receive shadows, um, doesn't receive transparency effects, shadows only, etc. So how it basically interacts with the rest of the scene. But again, that's only really useful when you're dealing in Blender.
So that's the, that's the essence of a material. Every single object has a material. Um, you could ignore if you're working in game mode 99.9% .9 of this. Even if, especially if your surface is 100% textured, you don't even need a diffuse map. You can have this completely meaningless and doesn't matter. But just be aware there is a material for every surface, and if you want to set simple things like um, the transparency level or the color, this is where you do it. Okay. Now the important part here though is your mapping. Now this is where you can add multiple maps onto your um, 3D object. Uh, now as I said earlier, a map is a way of taking a 2D image and applying it to a 3D surface. And it's very simple things like, uh, um, let's say in a 3D game you might have your face mapped to um, a head or you might have, you know, I'll show you a very simple concept. Um, no, nah, I won't. Uh, you could have like a, a the map, like if you took a globe in the real world, this is actually a real world application of texture mapping. Somebody's physically done this. It's basically, you know, a globe is a, just a circle with a picture of the world basically plastered on top of it. It's the exact same process in 3D, uh, but it's done via this map. Now, that kind of boils down to there are there's Unfortunately, the word map is used too often because you've got like normal map, texture, map, etc. And those basically are just saying picture or texture. Now the map, the actual thing that plots one item to another is the UV map. And that is critical. Now let's go back here. We'll go back to, let's say textured mode here. And this is a basic cube. And I'm going to go ahead and we're going to make something very, very simple today. And we're going to make a dice or a die. A die. I think it's a die. Uh, just to very simply take this cube, unmap it um, so that we can paint it in three dimensions. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about here. And then we're going to go ahead and create um, a texture map pretty much to, to um, apply on the color channel here. Okay, so first thing we need to do is create the UV mapping. And this is a little confusing because we actually have to do this in edit mode. So we're going to need another window here. We're going to need less of this window here. And I'm going to switch this guy over to UV Image Editor. So this guy is performing. And I kind of wish they didn't do this. I wish they could split these up into two different tasks. Um, but UV Image Editor is used as the image editor in Blender, the image painter slash viewer, etc. in Blender, and also is used for UV mapping. Now, UV mapping, like I said, is that process of taking something that's 2D and, sorry, 3D and 2D and making a map between the two. So go back to the idea of a globe. Um, a globe isn't just a normal image put on a map. You can't just take a square image and map it around um, a globe. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. So what you kind of essentially have to do is take that flat surface or the globe itself before it's turned into a globe and you flatten it out and then you can plaster your picture over top of it and then you can turn it back into a like a 3D shape. Well, we're going to essentially do the same thing with our cube here. What we need to do is turn this guy flat. And that process is creating something called a UV map. Now, let's do that. First thing we do, switch over here to edit mode. Yeah, I'll bring my tools windows back up here. We're going to ultimately use this menu right here. And what we want to do is think about this guy. And this is something I'm actually not very good at. My, my brain does not work well in these parameters. But what we want to do is take this guy right here and flatten it somehow. Now picture yourself having a virtual pair of, sh of scissors. I'm going to switch here over to edge mode. And what we want to do is figure out a way to cut this guy so that it would be a single flat shape. And that we're going to do, we're going to take this edge, this edge, and this edge, right? So picture you just took a pair of scissors and you cut here, here, and here. So now that this guy, once that was cut, would be able to flap down here, right? Like so. And the next thing we need to do now is figure out how to do it with the rest of the surface. Well, if we took this guy here, here, and here, we could now flap this end down here, right? So we could have flatten it here, flatten it here. Now the problem is we still have this square here that's all connected, so we need to make at least one more cut, right? So we'll grab that edge, and I'll picture with a pair of scissors. You cut here then, so you cut here, you cut this section here, this section here, right? So this end can fold down this way, this end can fold down this way, and with this cut, this guy can fold this way, and then this guy, this guy, and that guy can all fold flat coming out this way. 
right? So if you picture that in your head, these are the scissor lines you would cut. Now, those are the seams that we want to unmap with. Now, we just sit here and we go, mark seam, right? So now if you sit here, I'll, I'll unselect everything. We now have these red lines where the seams are being marked. And those are where our UV maps are basically going to be cut, okay? So now all we do is we select everything. So hit A. See, I've got all of my surface selected. In. I just come over here and I go mesh, that guy, UV unwrap, and then unwrap. And then boom, this is exactly what it's just done. So you can see right here, this cut is, let's see, it'd be that, probably that guy right there. Um, then the loop came and it created this cut and this cut. So now what we've shown Blender is how to treat um, a 3D surface as a flat surface. So now this face right here will get mapped onto this guy. Now I'll actually show you a little trick here. It's kind of neat and very useful to know. Is if, when you're in here in uh, so I missed. All right, let's put our pivot somewhere back to normal. You're here in the uh, UV editor. You can now click this guy. Keep UV edit and edit mesh in sync. So I grab him. So again, now I got that turned on. Whatever I select over here, let's see. So now that I'm in that, so the minute I press that, you saw right here we're dealing with um, UV coordinates. Each one of these little dots is sort of like a vertices, but it's actually a UV. It's a 2D, um, think again, UV is just like X and Y. It's a 2D coordinate, and that's all. There's no magic or no special meaning to the words UV. It's just literally X, Y, and Z were already taken. I don't know why they didn't like W. Um, so that's why they've used U and V. That's all U and V mean. They're just like X and Y. They're just X and Y coordinates in 2D space with, you know, going from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. Whereas 0 and 0 is the very top left, 1 and 1 is the very bottom right. It's literally just a simple 2D coordinate system. That's all a UV coordinate is. And it's saying where in 2D space to put whatever image is below. And we haven't applied a texture yet, so that's going to be important. You'll see how that works in a second. But by clicking this guy, so here we're dealing in UVs, uh, UV island selections like so. I can click here, and now we switch and we're dealing with uh, vertices, edges, and faces. So I come here, and this particular UV, I click it. Oh, I'm in, uh, I'm in edge mode. Let me click over to face mode. So I click this face, and you'll see it corresponds to that face. I click this face. It's the bottom one. So you can see how our cut works. So I can actually come down. I'll go get the edges. So this was the one. All right, why are you giving me multiple? There. The one selection of edges that we cut, and you can see over here the selection is there. So this is how that mapping between these two works. And if you want your selection over here, so I put A over here, it selects everything over here. This is what makes the connection between uh, your 3D view and your UV editing view live, so that when you update one, the other one updates. Now I'm going to turn that right back off, and I'm going to show you something kind of confusing about how Blender works. So if I'm sitting over here, I've got my UV editing on, but I'm over here in edit mode, and I select, uh, let's go over to face mode, and select a single face. You'll see over here, everything else disappeared. So you'll only see the UV maps that are currently selected without that being turned on. So I turn that back on, you can see all of them. Turn that off, you can only see the currently selected. So here, select all, you see everything. Select none, you see nothing. Uh, so that's a point of confusion. The UV map is still set, um, but it just isn't shown. Or So the, the selection that you have selected in the 3D view, if this isn't turned on, is going to only show you in the, the UV view what is selected over here. So the important thing to understand, it's not really changing anything, it's just showing you only the selected, again, unless that's turned on. So uh, when you unwrap, also that's important to understand too, when you do hit unwrap, make sure you have everything selected or you're only going to unwrap a portion. Now I can also come through here and I could change um, the orientation. I could change these seams, etc., that I set the first time. So here's our current UV mapping. And let me just go back to object mode over here. And I'll go back to edge mode. And I shall grab, so this was the seam we selected. Those were the two edges, right? And then we have that one single cut. So now I'm going to clear those cuts. And now we have a single cut here. This is going to create a rather odd. So make sure you select everything, like so. And then go Mesh UV Unwrap. Unwrap. 
And you'll see, because we only have a single line, it's going to create this really stupid version. Well, last time we had this side cut. Now, let's say we wanted to, like the orientation to be slightly different, or we want to change our UV map. I'll just come back over here. Um, oops, here, let me just select everything, clear the seams. So we now have no seams marked. And instead of doing those particular angles, I'm going to do, say, it's ultimately the exact same thing I'm doing here. I'm just picking from a different direction. So... That, 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 and then we'll grab that guy as our exact same logic. It's just turned a bit. Just showing you how you can change uh, an existing UV map whenever you want. So we've selected those seams. I mark them. And I un... Oops. Select everything. And unwrap. And it, it, all it did really is it changed the orientation that this map came at. And that's it. Now, it's important to realize that this guy over here... Let's go back over here for now. This layout, this map that's generated, you can manipulate the hell out of this thing. And it's the same controls you already use. So, for example, let's say we wanted to lay this out vertically. So instead of changing everything I just did, I could actually just use the same controls. B for a box select, grab everything, and I can do a rotate, like so. I can reorientate it up a bit. And then I'll do a grab, move it up slightly. Scale to make it fit a little bit better. Just rotate it slightly more so that it's straight at the top. Down shift, give me a precise rotate. There we go. So you can manipulate the way that the UVs are laid out using the exact same tools you already know. Grab, rotate, scale, uh, box select, circle select, etc. They all work exactly as you expect. And you can also grab an individual UV and move it around. This is literally just a 2 to 3D mapping. Now let's, let's move on and actually map something. And that means we need to have a texture map applied. So we have a UV map, that's very important. So now we can map something into 3D space. Let's create that texture that we're going to map on. And come over here and you're going to see there are hundreds of options here. So yeah, well actually there's like 14. Uh, so that might be a little hyperbole. Uh, everything you see here is completely useless for exporting externally. This stuff is all, <coughs> excuse me, only really useful inside of Blender, period. Okay? so. Uh, what you see here, this ocean, um, well, some things might support noise, but for the most part, these are all mathematic procedural textures. And again, if you're working only in Blender, you're creating a scene that you're going to render yourself, or you're going to render to texture, then apply that texture when you export. Use anything here you want. But for the most part, 99.99999% of the time, all you want is this guy. As that's to map an image or a movie onto the surface. And let's do that. So... I just created a new, as you can see, you have multiple textures uh, on a single material. Uh, we went ahead and created a new texture right here. And here's a preview of it because there's nothing to it. And you've got uh, pretty much one of two options here. You can either create one yourself from scratch, or you can go ahead and load an existing, uh, if you have an image file, any of the supported files that Blender supports, including actually movies. Now, the movie textures generally aren't supported by game engines, um, but if you want to texture map uh, an MP4 or an AVI or whatever to the surface of an object, you can. Uh, again, most game engines probably don't support it, but that is your option. So we just created a new texture, made it of type image or movie, and now what we want to do is go ahead, and I'm just going to create one program. I'm going to create one inside of Blender as opposed to loading one from an existing texture. So, new. And that brings up this little window here. You can name it. Uh, so we'll call this um, image texture. Uh, next up is your dimensions. This is going to create it as 1024 by 1024 pixels. So you can make this value whatever the hell you want. However, a lot of game engines like it to be a power of 2. Uh, in size in both directions. That means uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, uh, what am I at? 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096. And then really you don't want to go much past 4096 because a lot of hardware doesn't support it. Uh, so essentially you want your X coordinate to be, or your X width to be uh, one of those values, and you want your height to be one of those values. Now you can do 1024 by 512, whatever, it's fine. Um, you can also share a texture across different surfaces. So if you have one image with multiple textures in it, totally fine. Uh, you can use a portion of a texture, no problem. Uh, in fact, that's a very common thing to do. You have one image that's used um, across the surface where you have all different kinds of things. Like you could have uh, part of the image is dedicated to the gun, part of it's to the hair, part of it's to the eyes, to the face of a character, etc. Totally fine. Uh, pack things in there however you want. Just try to keep your dimensions as power of two if you're going to a game engine. Uh, if you're staying in Blender, doesn't matter. Do whatever the hell you want. 
So we're creating a new uh, texture called image texture. Uh, we will make the background actually white because like I said, I'm making a very quick dice, so dye, dye. So we've got a whitish color. Uh, we want an alpha channel. Uh, that means we want, um, so it's not just going to be red, green, blue. It's going to be red, green, blue, alpha. And alpha is ultimately your transparency channel. So yeah, go ahead and create that. Now your other option here, you could have it create a UV grid or a color grid. This is just like a, this is a black checker pattern. And this is a color kind of checker pattern. And it just shows you if there's any weird warps or um, uh, bad definition in the way you've UV unwrapped. That's, so that's generally where a lot of textures start from. And then they paint over top of it. In this case, we're just going to go with a, a standard white and keep it as blank. And now that we have our texture generated, let's click OK. And then boom, we now have this texture called image texture. Um, now, I will cover that in a second. So <coughs> come back over here. We got our surface, and we have our unmapping, and we have a texture. Now let's kind of make it active. You come back here, and there's this guy. And this is a list of all of the images currently available inside of this blend file. Uh, and we're just going to go ahead and we're going to add this image texture. And now you're going to start seeing how texture mapping works. See, this is a blank 2D image, all white. This is in the back. And over top, you can see the um, um, the UV mapping um, overlapped on top of it. So kind of that's the extent of it. So now if we come back here and I go to, well, actually, some material, you'll see this, this guy right here is white. Now, let me show you a little trick with material. Now, when you're dealing here, like, why the hell is this surface black? Well, that's because we have a light in our scene. All right, so the default scene has a camera and a light in it. And we're seeing the effects of that light on our object. So if I grab this light right here, uh, oh, I'm in edit mode. Okay, switch to object mode, grab that light, and I move it around. You'll see it affects the scene differently. Now, sometimes though, you don't want this at all. It's very irritating um, trying to see something that you don't want the world's lighting to affect. Of course, you could delete your light, and you'll end up with a scene looking somewhat like this. Because Oh, that's only because... Let me grab this guy. I think I have actually... No, it's not emitting. Okay, I'm kind of shocked it's got any color at all. Uh, but if you want the scene to... Uh, so let's undo that, bring our light back. There. If you want the lighting in the scene, the Blender scene, to have absolutely no effect on your surface at all, you can, with your object selected, come into your material right here and select Shadeless. And boom. Now you will have no lighting effects at all from Blender. Now... This property may or may not be picked up by the game engine, so you probably want to ultimately turn it off. But this kind of essentially says, don't cast shadows, don't cast um, light intensity, etc. So the lighting in the scene essentially doesn't work, and everything is lit evenly and basically 100% when you have shadeless selected. And it's very handy when you're just doing work like this, straight normal texture stuff. So now I'm come back in. Again, you'll see though, I have the UV editor over here um, active, but I don't see my UV anymore. Well, that's because I switched out of edit mode. So I come back over here, switch back into edit mode, and then I've got everything selected. I can see the mapping as it's going to happen. Now what we're going to want to do, uh, a couple things. First, I'm going to go ahead and save our file, because I want to show you how something works in Blender, because this is going to be very critical when you start exporting things out of Blender, is uh, how files are done. So we're going to save our file right now, and we'll just call this c colon slash temp. And we'll create a new directory, and we will call it um, dice, and go into dice, and we will call this die, like so. All right, so we now have our, I just saved our Blender file somewhere. It's kind of important to what we're about to do. Uh, you come down here, and you see this in the image editor here. So we went ahead and we created this white image, um, and we can make changes and such to it, but we've never actually saved it. So you can save it either externally or inside of the blend file. If you save an image or a texture in Blender inside of the blend file, it's actually literally stored in your .bland file. Your blend file becomes bigger, your texture is stored right inside of it. Um, all great and dandy, except a lot of game engines are going to want you to use it as an image file. So they're going to want your textures to actually be externally available. Some game engines will actually support so. Um, like FBX and Colada, uh, the two most popular file export import versions, both basically owned by Autodesk these days. FBX is literally owned by Audio Autodesk. Uh, Colada is uh, an industry standard, but Autodesk is pretty much dominating the industry. So uh, those are the two big game engine formats. And almost every single game engine uses one or both of those two file formats. And they do both have 
the ability to actually no FBX might not. Uh, but Collada has the ability to pack images internally. Now, the, will your game engine actually support that? Who knows? Now, your other question is, if you have a texture that you want to support across multiple uh, different game objects, then you're going to have duplication if you embed it. So a lot of times what you're going to want to do is make your, um, your image external. So you have this guy called image texture, but there's no name. There's no file location. So I come down here and I go and look at the texture itself. Its location is... Nowhere. It's embedded inside of the blend file. Now what we want to do is come down here and go save as image. And since we have our location, it's right there. It's called image texture.png automatically. And we'll just go ahead and save that. That's perfect. So now our our source is actually defined. It's no longer just embedded in the blend file. It's um, it's external. Now if you want to do this otherwise, you could also have gone pack image. And if I select pack image, then that image will now be pulled out of being a file and packed inside of the blend file. And at the same time, you can come back in later on and go to File, External Data, and then unpack all into files, and it'll push all of the embedded content back out of the blend file. So you can switch back and forth however you want to do it. And sometimes, you know, especially if you're going to want to share a blend file with, like, you got 30 or 40 different textures, you want to send it to somebody else, packing all of it into a single file definitely has its advantages. So those are your two options. Okay, so anyways, we have our, this is a 2D image, and this is an overlaid view of the um, the UV coordinates on top of that image. Now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and paint this image. We're going to create a simple dice texture. Now the neat thing is Blender actually has painting tools built right in as well. And let's use them now. So right down here we go down to the menu. Let's just pull this over a little bit. Oh I suppose to show you one last thing before I go. Now over here 3D view, remember how you got your tools and properties, right? So T brings up this side guy with all these different uh, context sensitive tools. And then N brings up all of these little settings that are appropriate to the, an object in the 3D scene. Oops, kind of ruined my, my surprise there. All right, so in 3D you have these options. Well, if you come into your UV view here, your 2D view, you've also got the same thing. So if I press T, it brings up context sensitive tools on this side. I press N, it brings up UV specific properties on this side. Um, you use this these two panels a little bit less often than you will use uh, these two, but with the tool we're about to use, I'll slow down and also remember there's a little checkbox you can use to uh, expand it as well if you wish. Um, when we get into paint mode, this guy's very important, so I'll turn that tool off right now. Um, so all you do is you come down here and you go from the view mode right here, and we're just going to switch that over to paint. That's it. So now we're in paint mode, and you saw, I, I don't know, this seems like a bug to me. Um, there's like this cursor, but it's only active when I'm not over my image. I do think that's a bug, actually. I don't think it used to do that. Um, but anyways, I don't know. If I unlock, no, lock won't do it. Yeah, so I don't know why I'm not actually getting my, um, tool over top of the actual image. I th again, I think it is a bug with the version I'm running, 2.73. Um, cause I should see this surface, like this, um, selection when I'm over top of my image to paint, but I don't. So, um, anyways, now that we switch into paint mode over here, you'll notice down here. So this guy here is where we can switch between the images we want to have active, but our menu just changed a little bit. Um, so we can switch between draw, soft and smear, clone, fill and mask. Pretty common, um, 2D painting things. You can zoom in, zoom out, etc. but I'll bring the tools back up. All right here, you can also switch between the various different options. So we've got a clone brush, we can um, color fill, uh, mask over an image, smearing, soften, and texture draw. And we're going to want to do texture draw, which is also known as painting. Um, I'm going to pick my color, normal, typical color wheel. Uh, I want black, so it works for me. Uh, I don't want it to spray at all. I want it to be like on or off, like so. And the radius is, well, this is that circle. Um, I want a slightly smaller radius like so, and it should be showing over top of the image. I don't know why it isn't, uh, but, so you can come down here, you can you can paint a texture, you could actually create a single texture and paint it over and over again, like if you had a blade of grass, or um, I could create a more fancy circle that I'm about to use and paint, use that particular image texture to paint with. Um, you change the way your stroke worked, um, your the angle that you're painting from, your paint stroke methods, um, so you can have like airbrushing, etc. So, so there's a lot of um, actual painting stuff in here, like you would see from a pretty fancy um, your your curvature of your painting effect. So a linear fall off versus a sharp fall off, etc. Um, 
there's actually quite a powerful paint package actually built into Blender. And you can also have your, your blend modes. Um, this is sort of like your, you know, dodge and burn. Um, you can change just the color, add, additive, subtractive, mixing, hue, specularity, um, dodging, etc. So this is where you can decide how what you're painting is going to affect the existing color. In my case, we're just we're painting, mix. Um, so this is just going to literally add the color I paint onto the surface. And I'm just going to create the faces of the dye on our surface. So right here, so there's one, there's two. Now you'll notice over here in 3D View, our texture is actually being updated live. So let's paint three. If there's actually a layout to how dice work, I apologize. I don't actually know. And there's four. Then there's five, and then finally six. World's ugliest dice. Uh, but you'll see we just created this 2D texture, uh, like so, and it is being applied to this surface here. That's quite literally it. So I come back here, so we edit our image. You'll see right here, right next to the image, there's an asterisk here. That's because it hasn't been saved. Um, let's we'll go ahead. Oop. Oh, I missed. Oh, crap. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, uh, this is just so fun to paint that. I shall. So as you just witnessed, you can also reload your image if you click the wrong button. Let's try that one more time, and I shall be a little bit more accurate with my mousing. So five, and then finally six. All right, so there's our dice, like so. There is our 2D image, our um, overlaid UV map sitting on top. Uh, you can actually also, and sometimes you want to just treat this as an image, as opposed to, like, so this right here is an overlay of our UV map. Very handy, so you can see how things will apply to the dice, because all of this white space outside of the UV map is completely useless. I can sit here and I can do whatever the heck I want with it. It's not actually being drawn on anywhere. Uh, so you can see our 2D image is ultimately changing, but only the things inside of the UV map are actually going to be of any use at all. Um, I'm going to do that because I don't actually want to do that. So this guy here is an overlay of what the underlying UV map is. So um, this selection here is going to be mapped here. And that's all your kind of corresponding thing is. Um, if you don't want that, however, you come over here to View, and see it says Draw Texture Paint UVs, you can turn that off. So then you're just dealing with a 2D image editor, if, if that's what you wish to do. And turn that back on. Uh, and the majority of the times, you're going to want that enabled. Um, and then Update Automatically is showing you the updates over here. That's what's actually controlling that. Uh, so if you didn't want it to do that, you could turn it off right there. I don't know particularly why you would do that. So now I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to very carefully not press Reload Image. So I'm just going to sit here and go, save image. So now our texture right here says ctemp dice image texture png has been saved. Let me just show you that. So we're going to go into temp dice and now you'll see we have our blend file and our texture file like so. That's it. So now if I come on back here over into Blender, uh, our Blender is unsaved so let me just save that. And we could go ahead, if you really wanted, uh, let's go to our 3D view, and we'll switch to the camera mode, like so. And let's just render that guy. Ah, okay, very key point. I have not done something wrong, and the, the uh, editor is hiding my mistake. Um, okay, so we set everything up. I have not set something yet, so it actually should not be mapping over here. Um, it is not right yet, and this is a very handy thing to, to actually learn. Uh, I'm glad I just screwed up so you guys can see it. Um, I haven't set the UV map up yet. Uh, so I created this texture, I created the UV map, but I did not tell the texture which UV map to use. Now in the editor here, it's knowing, because um, I've got both of them set, but the map itself needs to be set too. So let's go on back over here. So again, you're in your texture setting. Here's the image we just created. Now let's scroll down a little bit more on that guy. And you'll see right here, mapping. And as coordinates, there's generated. Um, and we don't want generated. We actually want UV. Right? And then when you click down here and just go click, and there's map, and you pick UV map. And now it's going to know to actually use the UV map that we assigned. So you have to set this. You literally have to set this, or you will get a render result like we just saw so I come back here and we'll go back to the render result, you'll get this. And obviously this is because you're 
your texture mapping is very wrong. Basically, it's just mapping everything to the top of the square, which is not what you want. Let's go back to our image. So again, as I saw, now that you can see it, all of the things, including the most recent render, all of the images, etc., in uh, in the particular blend or linked to the blend are available in this drop down menu right here. So that's how I was able to switch back to the render result. Let me go back to the image texture like so. So now that we've set this UV map, now I can come back over here and we'll render and you'll see it's done right. So important lesson, glad I ran into that. Uh, that one's pretty important. Okay, so that is now, uh, yeah, basically there is your first ever uh, image texture mapped uh, 3D object in Blender. You can export this out to a game engine of choice. Um, you know, actually, I'll show you. So file, now let's export that to FBX. We'll call it die.fbx, leave it in the same folder. Uh, just go in here and uh, I think I have an FBX viewer. Yep, yeah, right here. So this is uh, Autodesk's 3D viewer. I'll uh, just come in and do an open. And this is a very weird. Okay, so it's in my downloads. Ooh. All right, drive C. Oops, wrong temp. Uh, temp. Uh, dice. Die. Open. And there you go. Our image is not textured. Why are you not textured? Hmm. Uh, come on, menu. Texture. I want textured. Well, isn't that a kick in the ass? Textured. Uh, okay, why did you not load the texture? You know what? This might actually be one of those examples. Let me just head back in. I shall go back to the material. I told you some engines require this face texture to be set. So file, export, FBX. Make sure there's not any weird options here. So I want much everything. Path mode. What size this is? We'll do absolute pathing. Uh, that's the path mode to files, etc. And let's export that guy. Go back to our editor and open. Oh, that's infuriating. Okay, very bad example. Uh, don't know why it is not exporting correctly. Um, it's set up right. It's textured right. It's UV mapped. Uh, one second. All right, a little bit off on a tangent here, but I figured out what's going on here. Uh, it's, it's the FBX's viewer issue, not Blender's. Uh, but if you're going to export uh, out of Blender to uh, FBX format, and for some reason the file isn't working out, do your export this way. Uh, so with your object selected, or not selected, it doesn't really matter, we're going to export everything. Uh, come on over here to your FBX export. Uh, and we're actually exporting the mesh only, so I'm just going to select mesh here. Uh, the kicker is down here, ultimately, what we want to do is set the path mode to copy. So we're going to copy in the files, and we're going to click on embed textures. Uh, so what we're actually doing is we're putting the texture into the FBX file. Uh, the FBX file is going to grow a lot, uh, but that should be fine. So we're going to head and do the export, and now click over here, fire up our XP FBX viewer. Uh, it's just a matter of the FBX viewer didn't automatically import the uh, associated PNG file. So if I brought the FBX into uh, Unity, Unreal, or um, Max Maya, etc., Soft Image, whatever, um, it would have grabbed the file. It's a little bit smarter than this viewer is. Uh, but now that we've got that exported, we grab this guy, opened up, and you will now see our texture is set like so. Um, that's it. Now what you are seeing here, this is kind of interesting. See how there's like that pinkish hue? Uh, this is because I actually set a non um, slightly off-white color here. So it's actually, remember I told you sometimes things are going to pick up uh, properties and deal with them, sometimes they're not going to. Um, the FBX export is actually using the diffuse property. So if we didn't want that, that uh, tinge, just make sure that this is actually set to full white. And that's why we were getting that pinkish. So if I come back here, then now, and we export back out. X settings already done. Like so. Now if we look at it. 
Coincidentally, this is a, a free FBX viewer available from Autodesk. Uh, it's a good way to preview if, if you have problems, if you do an export from one tool to another um, and your animation isn't working or something, you're like, why the hell isn't it working? Uh, this gives you another tool to actually just bring it in and preview it to see if there's something wrong. Now, not to say that this tool isn't wrong sometimes, uh, but as you can see, now that diffuse color is no longer affecting it. There's not that pinkish tinge anymore. Uh, so that's a 3D object exported outside of Blender and usable. This could be thrown into a game or whatever. Uh, and that's the process of actually making it. So let's close that down, back into Blender. Uh, so that is essentially it. Now we go back to our folder that we exported as. Once again, this guy here, this texture that we generated, and we, we worked on entirely inside of Blender, it's just an image, like so. So I could have just as easily opened it up in uh, GIMP, or in my case, I'll use paint.net. Let me just go ahead and grab, zoom in a bit. Where are my tools? Over here, uh, let me zoom in on one of these dots. I think that's the first dot. Let's give our dot a candy coated center, like so. So, make a quick change to our image, like so, and click save. Uh, blah 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 blah. That's fine. All right, so we just saved it. Uh, come back here, go image, and we do that reload that we actually intend to do this time. And you'll see, boom. It's updated like so. Uh, switch here back to our 3D view, and we go to the one sided of the dice. You will see it's changed here. So you're, you can edit your maps however you want. You can do them in your own third party program, um, totally your option, however you want. Uh, so that's ultimately the crux of it. This is the basics of how a texture map happens. Um, now you saw we did the UV editing via cutting. Um, and we we're dealing with a pretty simple shape to start with a cube. Um, and ultimately, when, you, when you're doing a UV unwrap of an object, you want to make it as um, you know, clean as possible. Otherwise, you can get weird tearing and texturing and such. Uh, but the process is also kind of a pain in the ass. As I said myself, I am not particularly great at um, UV unwrapping. It's not something I don't visualize how to unwrap things from 3D to 2 very intuitive. I can do a cube, obviously, because there's only like six sides. It's not that much of a, it's not rocket surgery by any means. Um, but with more complex images, it's a little bit trickier. Now, there are some tools that can make your life a little bit easier. Let me just show you that. Just Here we're, brand new scene. Again, no animation, so I'll just pop that guy out there, and we'll get rid of him. And what we're going to want to do is create something just a little bit more complex than a cube. Um, we'll go with, um, go with a sphere. UV sphere, like so. And we'll jack up the segments, and we'll jack up the rings a bit. Like that. All right, so we'll switch into edit mode. Like uh, him. And I'm just going to quickly add some detail to this guy. So I'll switch into a face mode here, go mesh, and I'm going to go into uh, proportional editing and enable that. Right, so why am I in vertice mode still? Face. All right. So let's grab a couple faces here. And we'll just pull that out. And we'll grab a couple faces here. All right. And pull, pull those out too. I just want a kind of a bit more complicated surface than what we had before. So, grab the pole here. Oops. So I'm using something called proportional editing, which is automatically going to grab uh, nearby surfaces as well. Uh, it just creates kind of a smoother selection phase. So let's grab that guy and pull that down. So there's a kind of a non-standard shape, a lot harder to UV unwrap than what we've got. Now. You can do your UV rim wraps pretty simple, make a crude job of it quite easy. Um, so let's switch over to here to edge mode. Grab everything, and we could just do like there and there. All right, so that's going to cut those two shapes. Oh, I just kind of expected to do more. All right, so there and say there. As long as it's continuous and it worked all the way to the pole, um, this will flay this shape into four corners. And then let's do one kind of about the center, like so. So we could really quickly do a UV unwrap that way. It's not going to be good. Uh, so go over here to UV edit image. So we can see the wrap we're generating. So there's our seam. We could go ahead with those, switch over here to our shading UV sets, and we're going to mark that seam. So those are where we're going to make our cut lines. Select everything and unwrap. And then boom, there's what it's going to cut into. So now you could kind of grab each one of these surfaces. So if I go over here and I'll, I'll make it live so you can see what's affecting what. Um, 
like this this set of UVs over here controls this chunk of the face, etc. So, and you could do this. Now, it's going to create kind of issues when you've got a shared surface from here, and then now you're going to have these guys over here. On this guy, your, your image would have to be smooth across those two, and ultimately what you would have to do is if there was a shared face here and then here, normally what you'll end up doing is taking these guys minus that selection. So, all right, my proportional editing is screwing everything up. Let me just turn that back off. Um, you can grab this island over here. You can also set it to, so I'll turn this off for a second because it's very annoying, off. Uh, I want island, face, island. All right, come on. So I can automatically select. So an island is a selection of UVs like this. Each chunk is an island. So you can set it to, to select mode over here over to island, and you can select all of these. So if I switch now back to here, yeah, there's not an easy way to switch these two. That's annoying. Um, but what you would ultimately want to do is have this edge here right beside this edge over here because they're going to share an image across them. And that's where you get something called like a UV seam. And that's a very messy, icky process. But that was a crude, quick way of UV unwrapping this. I, I put no real logic into how this cut would go. And I could also have gotten rid of this seam right here. So let me just switch back. Edge. Click. Clear seam. And then select everything and unwrap. And we end up with a lot less um, different chunks, so you have less different themes to deal with the texture spanning across them. Uh, UV mapping is definitely an art form, something you're going to learn in time. It takes a while. Um, you have a few options over here. You can change the way that it calculated everything. Um, you can change the, the thresholds it used to do things. Uh, but the end result, it's going to take a lot of work to getting used to how to unwrap things as nicely as possible. Now, if you're just doing something quick and dirty, or you don't care about nice, fast, or good resulting UVs, you have other options available to you. So I'm going to just select everything. I'll clear all seams so there's no unmapping. So if I now that there's no seams done, if I unmap this guy, so select everything, UV unwrap, and unwrap. I should get nothing. Why am I getting anything? All right, doesn't really matter. Um, so now we want to take this guy right here, and instead of us doing the unmap, we haven't we haven't defined any seams. It doesn't know how to cut it up or anything like that. We're going to come over here and go mesh UV unwrap, and we're going to use this smart UV project. And this is going to basically it looks at the surface using an algorithm from different angles and automatically creates um, a UV map for you. So let's go ahead and do that instead. And here it's doing its best job to cut things up in a way, um, to be honest, it did a terrible, terrible job. It actually normally does a lot better. Um, but you can change a couple of these values the way that, um, so you can change the way that the UV map is ultimately generated. You can change the angle it uses. Through, see there, now suddenly that is a slightly more usable map. Uh, that is a slightly less usable map. So we're going to change the angle threshold. This is the angle it used to determine if it should make a cut or not. And then your weighting can change a little bit. That doesn't really do much to help you. But your angle limit definitely makes an effect. But you have this um, you have this uh, smart UV option here for um, having it do its best job that it can. Now your other options are down here. Now this guy is kind of going to be um, you can do UV sort of at a time, and this will just basically create the UV map based off of what it can currently see. So here, let me show you that. So mesh UV unwrap project from view. And see what it's done? It's basically, it's just created a UV map based on what it can currently see. Um, so I could have done, uh, let's see, da boom, do I have back select turned on? No, I don't. Okay, so let's turn that off. Box select. So, okay. So I grab those faces right there. So I'm only going to map that set of faces right here that I've got selected and I could so with the camera set up here and then I could go mesh UV unwrap project from view and now it's selected those particular faces and cleared them. okay so now I have a completely useless map UV map reset ooh, ooh, that's not what I want map UV unwrap why are you not clearing? You should clear. All right, one second.
Okay, I'm running out of time, so I don't really want to dwell on this subject. Let's just, uh, show you two other things very, very quick, and then i got to move on to another subject that I should have covered more. Uh, so click a new one. So you've got another shape here. So let's say add. We'll go back to a sphere. Mesh. And give you a sphere. Like so. so you've got a sphere here in, the, in your scene, like so. And if you want to do a quickie UV unwrap, so you got your sphere here. You can also come in here and go Mesh, UV unwrap, and then you can do... Uh, if you have a cube, you can do cube projection, cylinder, or sphere. So sphere projection, like so. And let's kick on over to our, oops, not that, uh, UV image editor. And you'll see it automatically unwrapped it knowing that it's a, a spherical object. Now, it did a piss poor job. Let's just grab that guy in and move that back in. But that is, let's get that get flat in a spherical unmapping that it's done algorithmically. You could also then, this is going to look ludicrous because it's not a cylinder. Uh, could have just done cylindrical mapping using an algorithm or UV unwrap cube mapping. Uh, makes sense. If, so if I was actually, so let's actually do a reload on that one. Using a cube, switch it over, mesh, UV unwrap, cube projection, and then you come on over here and you see the end result. unwraps it for you. Uh, I, so what it's done here is there's actually overlapping going on. Um, so there are, grab one of these, see? You can see they're actually putting the same surface over the, the, the individual image as you go. So there's different unmapping options. You can unmap based off of your current view angle, etc. But for the most part, you're going to want to use one of two options. You're going to want to set your seams and use unwrap, or you're going to want to do a smart UV. Smart UV is basically if you're lazy, come in and it will automatically try and calculate the best map for you. It's a good place to start until you figure out how you're going to do your things. Um, so go from that for sure. Now let me just go back to our dice project. I should have covered this earlier. So here we are, we're editing our image inside of Blender uh, and we got this nice little overlay I told you about. So right here I can sit back down and go um, draw texture paint UVs and this is controlling that overlay. Well if you're working in something externally um, you're going to want this UV map, to be honest. Like You're going to want it as a background layer. So if you're working in Photoshop or Paint.net or whatever, you're going to want that. Unfortunately, you can easily get it. And you can just come up here, and you go to... I'm in the wrong setting. One sec. I get out of Paint mode and back into View mode. And I go to UVs, and I can do Export UV Layout. And we will call it Dye UV Layout. Like so. So paint.net's still handily open. So right here, you can see we already got the, let me just zoom out. We got our texture open automatically. I can come here and create a new layer. Let's say uh, layer, uh, all right, yeah, file, open. All right, how do I import a layer in, blend, in this? Uh, one sec, you don't need to watch me fumble over it. Ah, so I missed that, it's right here, import from file. And we'll go here, and go to temp, and then we go to uh, dice, and we can just grab it. And there you go. You can actually have this so then as your background layer, so you know where to draw it. Um, you can get, so you can get this UV outline, and you can export it. And it's available, again, using UVs, export UV layout. And I hate to do this. I really, really screwed up here in... Um, I didn't cover some things I really want to. So I'm actually going to make this an hour and five minutes with Blender. So sorry about the five extra minutes. Uh, my bad. I ran out of time on what I was doing. And there's something else I need to cover. And that is back to maps. So you get this concept. We'll do a quick, quick, quick overlap or over review of what we've just done. And then I can cover on to another thing very quickly. And the first thing you got here right now is uh, we come in, you create your object like so. You take your object and you set your seams or whatever and you unwrap it. This creates this 2D mapping that can be used to create and map an image from here onto your 3D surface. This is literally a two to three dimensional map. You're unrolling your 3D object to make it flat like this. And then that map is overlaid over top of an image file, which then creates the texture map. So that is how texture mapping works. Now, we used a texture for the color image here, but there are plenty of other textures, and there are a number of them that are supported uh, by different game engines, and there's a couple of them that are very key. One of them I'll follow up in a different video, because it's its own process. It's kind of convoluted. I've actually covered it earlier somewhere else. Um, so if you go through Game From Scratch, there is already details on this. But there's something called a normal map. Now, a normal map is 
it uses it's still an image it's, it's a color um, image it ends up looking they're blue um, let me just pop up a new wimp and I will show you um, normal map like so here you go these are normal maps they're always like this bluish tinge multicolored thing and what's going on here and here's a good example of how a normal map works from Wikipedia these are you take a really really high density um, model and then a low density version of it and the image map takes the contours and the shape of the high one and it generates a normal map which is um it's an encoding of x and y z values of this into an image and each one of these pixels each the the red the green and the blue values of this texture map correspond to an x y and z um coordinate for pixels that don't actually exist so what it is is a way of your um, your graphics card or whatever has built-in um, functionality that can add detail using these normal maps to you can have this very low resolution um, texture uh, sorry low resolution uh, mesh that is using the normal map from a very high resolution uh, so here's a 4 million triangle mesh, a 500 triangle mesh with a normal map rendered for it. And this is the end result you get because this guy appears to have so much more texture detail uh, because it's encoded in this normal map. And like I said, each one of these dots in this weird ass color, the red, green, and blue are each being used as the X, Y, and Z coordinates for each pixel on this image. So it's a way of encoding additional details into your um, your texture that don't actually exist there so it's a way of making very high-res looking low definition models and generally the way it's done is in your 3d application you model a high resolution version you model a low resolution version and then you do something called bake a normal map which generates one of these bluish looking color things and this is just um, it's just additional information available that's not in the low resolution version so it fakes it to look like there's more geometry available now normal maps have become very common um, you know, first generation, second generation hardware like uh, uh, the original iPhone or early Android devices did not support normal maps. Uh, pretty much everything does now. And it's a great way of getting additional um, resolution in for a very low cost because it's built into the hardware. Uh, again, it's a huge process. I'll cover it as a separate thing if there's enough interest in it. Uh, but be aware of that. You have these additional map types. And when we came in, we created our texture right here. We're just using it right now. If I scroll down here, we're using it to affect the... so it's influencing the color channel. Now you see there's all of these other ones here though. Um, displacement, uh, normal right here, so normal and displacement and then bump are a couple of the really key ones. And then you've got also alpha. Um, you can have an alpha mask which basically is um, a transparency control. Um, so I could put an alpha map over top of this and then based on the color that's in the map and that's how transparent the underlying image is and you can layer a whole bunch of these maps on top of each other um, now the key ones you're going to see so obviously um, a texture map is this guy that we've created here it influences the color channel very key that that is the core fundamental texture map is a color map or diffuse map to be called one of those two things and they're key uh, every game every asset pretty much is going to have a texture map of some kind of that of, of a diffuse or a color map that's the normal what we've dealt with that's what we just created on top there are three kind of major ones that are used quite often are the normal maps which i talked about earlier it's a way of um, encoding detail or higher resolution detail so i can fake um, properties into it but they actually the gpu is handling it and it's actually creating more detail on the the end result there's also a displacement and bump map now bump maps fake um, you can put a bump map on it's just basically if there's a color there it raises it up if there's no color there it lowers it down and it's working on the normal the normal is uh, kind of how f it's, it's the direction a face is facing or the depth of a face if you want to look at it that way and so when you're saying something if it's got um, a bump map and if there's like a black pixel there it will or sorry if it's a white pixel it'll raise it up a black pixel it'll do nothing and it's a way of adding or faking um, additional kind of depth to an object so I could do a bump map here I could actually turn I could create an inverse of this guy right here um, so if I just literally inverted this channel so that where everything is black is white and applied that as a bump map that would make this a white circle this a white circle this a white circle this a white circle and when the bump map is applied it would make it appear 
that each one of these things was recessed. And that's effectively what a bump map does. It adds fake depth. Now there's also something called a normal map. A normal map is like a bump map, sorry, a displacement map. It's very confusing because a normal map doesn't actually use normals. A normal map encodes um, three-dimensional things, say x, y, and z coordinates. Well, there's something called a displacement map, which again, very confusing here, but it actually physically moves the geometry when rendered along the normal. Based off, all it can do, all that a displacement map can do is move um, the surface up or down. So if I have a normal map and it's fully on here, when it's rendered, this um, this face will be like kind of pushed down or pushed up. And it's an old-fashioned way or an older way of applying uh, depth to a surface that doesn't have depth. Uh, so that's a displacement map. Uh, so you got bump map, which is a way of faking um, textured depth on a surface. So like say you had an apple or an orange and you want it to be a little pitted, you could literally create a surface of, you know, just blotted blackness on a, a white background. And that could be applied to the surface and it'll give it the illusion of being pitted. Um, you can have a normal map, which encodes a whole lot more uh, positional information from a higher resolution map or a higher resolution object and encodes it and applies it to a lower resolution version, allowing you to apply a lot more detail to an object without a lot of geometry. And finally, you got a displacement map, which um, is kind of like a normal map, but it doesn't encode in X, Y, Z. It just encodes in the normal, the up and down, basically, of any given, um, of, of the applied face. So those are three other kinds of maps that we kind of didn't touch on. I should have. Uh, and they're controlled here. And as you can see, there's all these other different ones too. You can, how this thing will influence or um, handle the surface. And they're way beyond what we're going to want to get into. But those are the three that are often supported by a particular engine. Now, some engines will also um, support uh, specular maps or ambient maps or a few other kind of uh, different things. If you get into um, Unity or uh, Unreal, you'll, you'll see exactly what they support. Um, but it's just pretty much it's the same concept. It's just the value, the pixel values that in the map um, do different things than just color it. Instead, they're often representing depth or um, a lot of times you'll use a mask and they'll represent how light refracts or how transparent or translucent something is, etc. But it's the exact same process. You do it the exact same way and it ultimately all depends on if your game engine supports it or not. So sorry about that. I just actually went seven minutes over. I did not mean to. So welcome to another hour and seven minutes with Blender, but I hope that was useful for you. Uh, the whole concept is really kind of simple. You're really just kind of taking a 3D object and smushing it down to be a flat surface, and that creates something called a UV map. And then you've got your material, which sets the uh, general way that light interacts with your surface, things like setting the color, the reflectivity, translucency, etc. And then on top of that, you have a number of maps that you can apply. The most important being image maps or texture maps, which can be applied to different channels. The most of the time, the one channel you're going to use is going to be called either the diffuse or color channel. And that is what you could basically consider a texture map. But there are other maps that we didn't really cover here because I ran out of time. Things like normal maps, etc., which I will cover in a later video, I promise. But those can also be applied to the surface. So all the way through, the workflow is pretty much the same. And it's a pretty simple concept. So you take 3D objects, you tell it how you want to have it cut up, and that process is called creating a UV map. So once you've got that UV map, then you take your image and you just sort of uh, map the two together. Now, I did not even get close to covering. This is a very simple process. I did not um, I did not do anything here. So if, if I had, like, duplication, so if I had, um, I had two faces, I want them both to be threes, I could have taken this guy here, this guy here, grabbed, moved it down, like so that and you'll now see my three my one just became a three three so now I have two threes although one is inverted so there's a lot of things you can actually do here that we never touched on but the basic concept is the same you're creating a 2d map that corresponds with how an object is uh, how this image is applied to this 3d object and that is the essence of unwrapping and UV maps and what they do all right so I'm done now uh, a minute nine. Sorry about that. Wasted nine minutes of your life. I apologize. But hopefully that was useful. Uh, that is essentially texture mapping, UV mapping in Blender. Uh, enjoy. Have a good day. Bye.